Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to present this follow-up version, let's say, in, of our method developed by between the two groups, and this diverse group uh, and the University of Valladolid. I'm going to talk about how we capture features of hourly resolution energy models in an integrated assessment model for this 18th SDBS conference here in the Brown. Well, this presentation is structured as follows. Uh, I will start with a brief introduction to then comment some um, things about the framework. Um, then I will present the methodology and some results to finalize with conclusions. In agreement with uh, official reports of the IPCC, the effect of the anthropogenic carbon emissions is speeding up the climate change and damaging um, the nature and the human metabolism. So um, the proposals uh, on the table are based on a deep decarbonization of our economy and mostly based on renewable energies, especially solar and wind power energies. The challenge for integrated assessment models, which are broad models taking into account many different topics, for example, the economy, the energy, uh, the power, um, land uses, uh, climate, forest, and so on. Um, these uh, integrated assessment models run usually uh, in a time step of around the year. Uh, however, uh, to clearly represent the energy variability, we need statistically more at, at least the hour. This is a great challenge because the, the integration is not straightforward, uh, especially in what concerns to power system uh, planning. Our proposal is to parameterize uh, hourly data coming from energy plan, which is an hourly energy resolution model, to then via regression analysis estimate the, the depletion in the capacity factor of the two main technologies applied in, in these scenarios, the solar and wind uh, energies. The, regarding the framework, we, this method is conceptualized for the scenarios such as the green growth and the also uh, post-growth, uh, the growth, some, some scenarios based on what happened, even 100% um, renewable energy systems. So, but for this work, uh, we have um, conceptualize the green growth scenario. Uh, I'm going to present in the results uh, what happens when we switch on or off the feedbacks from this regression analysis, and also what happens if we introduce or not the flexibility options I mentioned there, uh, flexible demand, electric vehicles, synthetic fuels, and, endo and endogenous regulation of these uh, flexibility options. Uh, and and the implications into the renewable energy share, because what happens with curtailment, uh, what happens with the installation, the capacities, the capacity of stock, the land requirements, mineral requirements, emissions, and then investments. Regarding the method, this method has been already presented before here in the last the best conference here in Dubrovnik, and then uh, published in Renewable Energy last year. Um, Based in summary, um, we design the inputs and the outputs we are in, interested on in, of energy plan to then combine the inputs and outputs or to generate input files for, for energy plan that are run in with energy plan, the model, to have the results and then with via regression analysis we in relation the inputs and the outputs to finally those analytic equations are introduced in, into the IAM. Just to say here that there are two, three um, updates regarding the, from the article. The first one is the, um, the, the sign of the, of the experiment. We avoid with now the, um, the chess problem. That means that in the last uh, version, we combine the inputs um, so we had the, an exponential equation uh, of the number of uh, combinations. And now we apply Monte Carlo analysis to, uh, to avoid that. And then we um, perform parallel processing code to speed up the, 
the simulations. And finally, in the regression analysis, we have played also with lasso regression and step forward, back forward, uh, stepwise analysis. Uh, regarding the, the wall model, uh, William, which is the integrated essential model of the locomotion project, um, I saw now um, the end scope of the energy system. We are placed here on the bottom and on the bottom and, and left, uh, connected with the energy and use module, the basic mainly the energy transformation module, and also the capacity stock. In addition, there are more topics, for example, the calculation of the GHG emission in the, in the energy sector and taking into account also the potential of renewables and the famous ROI indicator, the energy return on energy investment. Mm. And regarding the, the results with the regression analysis, we, I plot here on the right, the, each point means uh, the coordinates uh, um, oh, between the prediction of the value of the depletion of solar power plants uh, with the regression model, the logistic regression models, and on the y-axis, the real value delivered by energy plan. We can see a linear relationship between um, in, in points in the cloud is close to and follows the straight line, red line, when that means the perfect uh, prediction. And also on the on the left, we can see that uh, all the residuals the, in the, this histogram are close to zero. So um, the regression is well balanced. Regarding the most relevant variables, uh, we can see here that for estimating the solar power energy, um, it is based most, mostly on the influence of the capacity of solar and the quadratic term of solar. And also zero GSG semiflex power plants, well, I mean, that, which are those uh, without emitting GSG emissions, uh, in this case, nuclear and geothermal power plants. And also the demand of hydrogen. In the case of uh, wind, we have more or less the same results in the cloud. Uh, so a linear relationship. Um, and the histogram is also close around zero. Uh, in this case, we this uh, decline of the wind power capacity factor relies on the influence of wind, but also solar and the quadratic term of solar, the GSG, the nuclear geothermal power plants, hydrogen demand, flexible demand. So it's more complex in this case the relationship. When, what happens when we introduce these uh, regressions into the integrated assessment model? Well, uh, in this figure, I saw uh, the, the, the same output that the regression analysis, uh, that is the depletion of the capacity factor of wind and solar power plants. Um, the dotted lines um, are those what, what follows the well, the are the cases when the flexibility options are introduced. So if we don't introduce uh, those flexibility options, you can see that the, for both cases, the curtailment will arise um, up to 0, 0 0.03 per, um, in the capacity factor. And when we apply the, the, um, the flexibility options, and the, this effect uh, sharply declines to zero in a first order as a first order response. But um, um, when we introduce these flexibility options, uh, what happens is that the flexibility, the, flex, the demand, the electricity demand increases and that generates a, is an stimulation of for new power plants. What in terms of the green growth scenario means that we are promoting more and more the renewable energies, especially these two, in the scenario. So we have here the set of renewable contribution to the electricity mix. And in this case, when we introduce the, those flexibility options, uh, the effect is that the share increases more than the baseline. 
Um, however, even with this uh, high promotion of the renewables, we have in 2050, 25% uh, of the primary energy demand came in from renewable energy sources. And some other effects, so for, for example, I'm going to add here to one more slide. In this case, we have the um, represented the, the steel and the Indian production for the European energy system. And the, the black dots, the lines, and the black, the black lines are uh, those with um, <clears throat> with the case of without the <clears throat> without flexibility options and without the the, regu the endogenous regulation of, of the flexibility options and without feedbacks. And we can see that when we introduce the feedbacks and also the dysregulation for the flexibility options, we increase a lot the, the, the production of these two materials. And the results um, show that uh, compared with 2020, the production of indium uh, will be 3.2 percent of the production we will need in 2050 worldwide. So 3.2 percent of the current production is just, so the current production in 2020 is just 3.2 percent what we need in, in 2050. And in the case of steel is a little lower, the 26 percent what we are consuming now. Uh, some conclusions are here exposed. Um, first of all, the response of, from the energy variability in, to the capacity expansion is one of the most interesting feedbacks for integrated assessment models, in, especially in case of the energy system. Um, uh, we have identified in the literature a uh, research line uh, identifying um, um, identified around the stylized functions program not only via regression analysis but but other um, such as the residual load duration curve and the, the, it's different to to other to other methods such as the hard linking or the soft linking and the coefficients of the regression analysis are constant assumptions what means that if we change uh, an hypothesis uh, in the in energy plan we need to rerun the all the simulations and the analysis to take it in, into account. Uh, regarding the last regression, backward and forward stepwise regression, and the feature, a com more complex feature selection, we we finally uh, select the for now the Pearson coefficient, the Pearson coefficient to to dynamize the the selection of of these inputs. Um, the best solution was found by studying at, at the end the, the ad hoc uh, selection of inputs uh, for the on, to include also quadratic combinations. The modern uh, feature selection methods such as this lasso have failed. Um, we need to analyze further why, especially because um, they remove the influence of stationary storage, which is uh, related basically with the design of the experiment um, when what we include as in the ranks um, for each input is very sensitive for then the, the regression analysis. The endogenous promotion of flexibility options uh, has delivered um, more integration in, of renewables and lower GHG emissions um, in the study. Uh, a self-regulation mechanism um, that needs, needs more, more research because it seems that it has potential to, to dynamize internally the, the promotion of new, new capacities of um, flexibility options. And in the perspectives from now is basically to compare and test more in the, this method and this method with, with others, and also uh, resolve the uncertainty about the parametrization. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Gonzalo. Uh, having flexibility options as endogenous uh, in the modeling is a very significant step and uh, addressing many of the needs. Uh, when comparing the results coming from the locomotion project with other uh, modeling results, what do you think should be uh, the basis of comparison? How should the results of the scenarios from your project, for example, in the MIMP, uh, scenario MIMP, what kind of variables should there be in order to compare uh, the, uh, the benefits of, of this approach with others, existing ones? Um, well, thank you for the question. In order to compare currently the results, I would say that we need a framework, to, a common framework within the projects that for now, I guess there is no one. Um, so that will be a, a work to do, to generate a platform in which uh, we can compare the for, for a specific topics such as the variability management of and the energy system, to compare the energy system, the energy models of different items, for example. So for, for now, our results mainly are is that the, with the promotion of renewables, uh, the curtailment will not be as uh, strong as other effects such as the the material availability, for example. Hello, I'm Ole uh, von Allen. I'm also part of the project, but there's a new result that I was interested about. What do you expect when we close the feedback loop when you um, add like the increased demand for steel in indium? If it will, like, will it create the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions or similar greenhouse gas emissions as the savings that we see from the variability management? Um, yeah, thank you very much, Ole. Um, well, the, the, increase, the, the increasing trend of the demand of electricity is going to generate new efforts to do in the power system. And it's correct that we're going to need uh, more material. So it's a complex balance. It's a point to study. I didn't focus the attention on, on, on the material side, but I just take some results warming about the complexity of this uh, energy transition, right? Uh, so, you know if ah yeah 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 yes it's, it's yeah it's further work to to know the material. Mm -hmm the materials we need for the, those flexibility options. Mm
Thank you for your presentation. Well, uh, can you hear me? Um, I, well, the question is validation. And second question is uh, a tool, uh, online tool. Uh, well, uh, not to go uh, very deeply in, in, the, in the theory of modeling, um, I would just say that uh, you, you can never validate uh, a model, uh, models like this. This is model. These models are uh, mainly used uh, to. I mean, validation will be that uh, we will be able to, let's say, predict the future. So, uh, in this regard, uh, validation will be that every time we uh, introduce uh, some uh, number of variables, if we introduce some parameters, when we introduce a goal function and change something, that we can uh, validate uh, uh, real policies. So we put in the real policies and then we get the feedback and then we, uh, let's say, get the, the realistic uh, result. And then we accommodate model to fit better with reality. This is regarding val validation. For this, uh, I think uh, this, is, uh, this job can be done for, to, put, uh, to put all of this uh, into, uh, online and uh, that every user every every citizen could uh, could change the parameters no it just it's, it's just a clarification because there is a presentation in this session about the uh, applications which will be done by roger so yes there are tools and they will be presented any questions Mark? Uh, just 
What do you think working? Yeah. What do you think it would have happened if instead of using the GDP as the optimization function, you would have used, uh, for instance, the Gini coefficient or, or some well being indicator? Well, uh, I, I will uh, put myself into situation if I'm a plumber, for example, and you ask me if you put uh, here uh, or there uh, your uh, pipe or or everything. So for me, uh, I'm a plumber. I do optimization. I I can put any uh, objective function into the you know into the computer and uh, whatever you want. That is the the idea flexibility. Um, I'm not. Uh, let's say uh, I don't. I don't. I feel that this will be uh, somehow more uh, uh, people friendly uh, idea uh, to to have uh, this as a goal function but uh, this have to be uh, shown this have to be explored more and more this is just a concept the title was the title of the supply demand dynamics integrated with the multi regional digital economy and energy presented Mr. Oliver Allen is coming from Finland University of Applied Science or Hamad Norway. Thank you very much. I just have to open the presentation. Hello. Yeah, should work. So, uh, yeah, I already got introduced. Thank you. I get the chance to speak here. Um, I would first like to thank my colleagues Inigo, Lucas and Inaki, who were part of the study because we developed this together. And then I will dive into something that you all probably wanted to see, but nobody got to see it yet. Because we are like uh, part of locomotion. What is locomotion? It's a big integrated assessment model and it consists of several uh, Submodules. We have like modeled the society, finance, economy, demography, energy system, and climate, land, water, and materials. And that part of materials is what I will present to you. So the locomotion concept is a mix of bottom up, top down, and uh, multi regional input output modeling. And we in the framework is system dynamics, and it's mainly a tool to, um, yeah, to model different kinds of policies and nonlinear relationships because the foundation is in system dynamics and we track social, economic and environmental variables. It's also important to mention that if you are interested in a certain submodule, you can link or connect all the models between each other. So that is something that we would like to mention. So now I show you uh, the part that um, I'm responsible for modeling in connection with uh, my colleague Inyaki and Lucas and Inigo. So, um, I'm responsible for the materials part, and I will particularly describe to you the model of crude oil and uh, natural gas and coal. I will use the example of the uh, oil model because they are all modeled in a similar way, but um, due to uh, like time issues, I will not go into the differentiations between the different models. And we also um, established three case studies with oil, and I will present you these ones. So I cannot explain you all the detail of the locomotion model. That would be too much. And uh, my colleague Ilya already mentioned that uh, we have a website there, like uh, material available if you're interested also in other submodules, which can be reached. And there's different deliverables that describe exactly what kind of data went into the model, what kind of validation took place, what kind of calibration did we use. And that's why I will focus only on describing you what I did in the fossil fuel model. First of all, I would like to highlight the feedback between the economy, the energy and the uh, fossil fuel models. And there we have economic activity creates like a final energy demand. The final energy demand will be translated into primary energy demand via uh, energy transformation chain in the energy model. Energy model delivers like a primary energy demand. So demand for oil, coal and gas to the materials model. And in the materials model, we model like the amount of resources, um, reserves, the price, uh, utilization of extraction infrastructure. And uh, then we deliver the prices to the economic model. 
and the economic model in the next time step calculates a new final energy demand based on this. So on the other side, like that was the um, triangle that I described to you. On the other side, you can see the in, like the detailed structure of how the um, fossil fuel model is made up, and I will try to point out. So here we have the part where we have the resources uh, moving via prospecting to the reserves, then the, the reserves get extracted. Here we track like the amount of oil that is already extracted and that will be extracted over the time of the model run. Here you see the part that I mentioned is um, the demand coming from the energy model, where we have the primary energy demand. Here we calculate the production of the oil model based on an average capacity per well, which is a simplification, we're aware of that. Um, but here we have the amount of active wells and then we uh, calculate the extraction capacity. And the tension between supply and demand determines a price, which is calibrated with the historical price. So a low spare capacity means a high price, a high spare capacity means a low price. And then we have like the estimated price, which is the uh, function that also gets sent to the economy model. And based on the price, we um, calculate the extraction in extraction infrastructure. So how many wells will be opened in the next year or will be utilized uh, to need to fulfill these demand. And this is the um, site where we decide between the, the amount of wells that are going to be built. We looked at the maximum that was ever built in the high price situation, set that as a cap, and then we go into the well infrastructure that gets built. We track the amount of wells, which are, of course, um, subject to depletion because wells run empty after a while. And um, we increase the amounts uh, of wells that leaving the active well stock when we reach over half of the total estimated resources, because we expect that it's more difficult to get out the remaining oil, and therefore the wells will have a shorter lifetime and uh, we will decrease the um, extraction capacity. So now I come to the um, scenario settings that we uh, tried out, and we wanted to try out different kind of frameworks for the model. We wanted to try a long time framework so we looked at different resource analysis we looked into like what is the lowest estimate that we can find to the highest estimate and what kind of implication does it have for our economy then we looked into the impacts of um, the opec countries so what uh, what kind of power do the opec countries have over the oil market and what is the effect on the economy then uh, we looked into a lockdown kind of scenario where we have like a household um transportation demand reduction due to a lockdown kind kind of simulation where we say like the people will travel less with personal transport and um aviation and all these kind of uh modes of transport and then the objective was to demonstrate the interlinkages that we have in the model so we wanted to look into uh, the functioning mechanisms between the energy economy and materials model we deliberately uh, disactivated all other models that are connected, and we also excluded te technological advancement in this state, and also fuel substitution and other kind of factors that would probably into uh, like come into play in the future. But um, what we wanted to show there is like basically uh, economy as it is right now with the dependencies on oils that we have. But it is important to mention that the price, for example, has also. Um, the potential when we activate all the feedbacks to uh, trigger a certain investment in the energy uh, system to switch from fossil fuels to renewable energies but this feedback was not switched on in this scenarios so what do we see in the effects so we see altered household expenditure on various transport modes we see a decrease in disposable income for other non-durable goods and reduce the overall real-term expenditure and then i will show you the case study one that is what I mentioned with the different resource estimates. We looked in the literature and looked for the different uh, maximum amounts of oil available in the world. And we identified like a framework where we can say this is the low or most pessimistic guess. Then we have a medium guess. And then we have a high estimation, which is based on uh, BGR and uh, EAR. Like, I'm sorry, like as a German, I always mess it up. Um, but uh, the gap here can be explained because we have to recalculate the values that we find in literature to the 2005 uh, values because like the materials model starts in the year 2005 and so we need to track back what uh, is 
or what was available in that time. Then we go to the um, results of the case study and that becomes really profound. So it, basically the first graph, I will start from uh, left to right. Uh, we tried um, linking the, uh, or not linking the materials model to the economy model. And that is the red line where you can see a GDP growth of annually 2.3%. And there's no price feedback, but what is really profound, uh, this GDP growth with the dependency on oil is not possible because we don't have that amount of oil if we uh, rely on the dependency. So what happened here is then we introduced the different resource estimations and the top line is the high estimation where we can see that our GDP would peak before the end of the century in the year 2086 because of the dependency on oil and then it's not enough oil available to keep the GDP and uh, economy growing in that sense and the oil peak would appear much earlier. Then we have the medium estimate where the peak of GDP would already happen in the year 2046, much, much earlier. And then we see a prominent decline from 20%, uh, um, like lower than the 2015 values in the end of the simulation. And the simulation time is here under the year 2100. Then in the low scenario, we see the peak of GDP already in the year 2027 and a prominent decline from the GDP levels that we have in 2015 to uh, a reduction of 70% by the end of the century, basically. So this is really, really bad implications. And that really highlights that we need to do the energy transition probably much faster than we anticipate to do them. And then we also looked, because it's a multi-regional model, we looked into the effects. By the way, the GDP is declining because the prices of oil get so high that uh, due to the scarcity. That, um, that the economy cannot afford, or like the, the households and the consumers cannot afford the amount of oil anymore. And that is also, I will come to this, why this approach is really novel in, in our study. But then we looked into the price developments and linking it to the GDP of different countries, or in this case, regions. And here we have two major oil importing nations like USMC and uh, EU27, or like conglomerates of countries. And then we see other regions that are oil rich, like uh, Russia and the rest of the world, which also is uh, withholding like Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, which are really oil producing nations. And there you can see for us, it's even more important as oil importing nations and major consumers to switch our dependency of oil fast because the oil prices will lead to a decline in our GDP if we don't do so. So and here in the last one, you can see the um, amount extracted, which is the lines that are going up and then the amount available, uh, remaining available um, going down. And you can see in the medium and in the low scenario, there's barely no oil left in the end of uh, the century when we continue with the consumption patterns that we have in the moment. So then we come to case study two. Here we looked at the uh, effects of the OPEC countries and what kind of power do they have on the oil, uh, oil economy energy feedback. And uh, we looked at a time frame from 2025 to 2030. The objective was to increase oil prices in one strategy. So how do we do this? By taking spare capacity of the market. So the OPEC countries decide to increase their spare capacity from uh, 3 million barrels per day to 6 million barrels per day. So that is like capacity that they withhold from the market. And in the second study, we wanted to decrease the oil prices to maybe discourage investment in extraction infrastructure. And that we did by um, taking uh, the spare capacity down from 3 million barrels per day to 0 million barrels per day. What do we see as an effect? So here's like the policy that we described. And we can clearly see that is affecting the oil price because in the scenario where we have like um, taking a lot of spare capacity off the market, the price is spiking up. And you can see also as a consequence, the effect in the GDP development. Here you can see if we uh, flood the market, so give more spare capacity to the market, we can see a price drop and the GDP is picking up because the oil is more affordable. So the economy is able to grow faster. So now I would like to come to the third case study. Um, here we looked at a reduction of the household transport. Um, that was an exogenous pulse. Like, so we said like in one year, we will say 
they will uh, use transport 20% less. And that is um, including road, aviation, train, and maritime transport. And um, after 2030, uh, the household um, transportation reverts to a normal state. So basically, lockdown is lifted. Uh, yeah, we, we followed a moderate uh, trajectory for the um, medium resource estimation, and we took the OPEC target price development also in a moderate tra trajectory. Okay, um, so yeah, we can see that uh, we can clearly model like the short term effect of the um, yeah of, of the lockdown situation because we can see the demand drop is tracked in the oil model. We can see also that the spare capacity is rising, and we can also track uh, the price drop in oil. So, I would like to conclude on this um, that we are able to model short term, medium, and long term effects with the model, and also do. Like intricate, like really detailed analysis of the relation between the fossil fuels and the energy and the economy models of the model. And the novel approach here lies basically in uh, how the linkage is done. Most model models um, work with supply cost curves, which is a static approach, and they often don't take into the limitation of limited resources or uh, how limited resources could increase the price for the resources and therefore have a negative effect on the economic development. And this is like what we tried to solve with this approach um, by linking, like making a full feedback loop and having these mechanisms tracked. And what would be advantage in the or an advantage in the future is that these price developments obviously lead to technological change when we activate some of the feedbacks. So we compared with other models, they mainly use uh, the supply and uh, cost curve structure, which is a static approach. And um, yeah, we think that the dynamic approach of integrating the biophysical limits is advantage or is an advantage over other models. Okay, then we like for the, I will hurry up the three case studies, we can say that GDP and oil demand extraction are deeply tied. Uh, shrinking oil resources amplify this interrelation, so they have a strong, strong implication on our economic development if we don't change the system as it is. Um, yeah, and we need uh, to uh, really do this transition fast to prevent the economic downturns. Resource-rich nations are less vulnerable than oil-importing nations, obviously. Uh, we could prove that the OPEC countries have a strong impact on the oil economy, on the price development and demand development. And uh, the market vulnerability um, is also modelable with this model. We can see that uh, the market, oil market is a really sensitive structure. Okay, then I will leave it here. I leave the slides for the questions if you want to ask questions. and. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, concluding that scarcity brings technological change. This is the critical uh, thing we should uh, draw out from these uh, calculations. Uh, there was never a problem of oil because we can produce oil from coal or anything else. Uh, it's just a question of price. Uh, so if uh, there is scarcity, price will go up and then there will be technological change. It can be uh, uh, production of alternative fuels or more probably it will be transitioned to new technologies. Uh, regarding other materials, uh, I found a very interesting information. I don't know if it's true and you are an expert, so I will ask you uh, here that all amounts of all materials we need for energy transition equals the, the weight of fossil fuels for one year only. Okay, okay. I'm not aware of that statement, uh, but thank you for your question, Evan. Um, I would argue that, like, so this is like one example. We don't know how the full picture looks like. So when we have uh, the coal model connected, the natural gas model connected, and the metal models connected that will consume metal for the energy transition, then we can see if we come into a scarcity situation in the combination, also when like renewables will be rolled out and if there's a discredit or like, or like a, a disbalance in that sense. What I like to say here is though, when we say like there is no scarcity, it's just switching because we say like we assume that we have technological advancement and because we observe scarcity in one material, 
that could occur for all other materials as well. It's just like this is depending on how much consumption we're going to uh, create and how much people are going to live in a certain living standard. So I think um, we need to look at the full picture to see that. And that's what we try with this approach. This is just one one of the resources that we model. And um, yeah, to your comment with the weight, I'm not aware of the of the total amounts of weight in that sense. But uh, I, I think what we can observe is that we see certain supply risk in certain materials and it is not fully mapped out yet. We try to uh, wrap this up to see a full picture and then utilize the, the, the effects of the price development of a certain resource, what it will trigger in certain kind of energy technology uh, rollout in that sense. Yeah. The title is the high of potential of the Yep. So much comes from the Thank you. Thank you. I will try to open the presentation so hello everybody thank you again uh, i will present my uh, our work with uh, some some people of the locomotion team about assessing hydro power potential under green economy scenarios using leo Melo. so first of all uh, wait sorry I'm sorry, I don't know how to work with this. Okay, no, wait. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Ah, okay, it's just uh, the, this. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, first of all, global hydropower installed capacity is expected to increase by 17% until 2030, a number from the International Energy Agency in 2021. Also, hydropower today has a key role in the transition to clean energy because it produces significant quantities of low carbon electricity and also has high production and storage flexibility. Also, hydropower can be integrated to wind, wind in solar power in the pumped storage uh, power plants it, it, because those output can vary depending on factors like the weather or the time of the day or the year. And finally, hydropower capacity depends on biophysical limitations, in particular built reservoirs and also precipitation changes. So in this case, we used climate data from FAO. We used uh, two ver climate variables, precipitation and potential evapotranspiration, to compute the ratio between them. And th that ratio reveals if that country or region can increase or decrease the available water. We use Three future scenarios, the B2 that is similar to the RCP 4.5, that is similar to the base scenario in the William model. We use the A2 that is similar to the RCP 6, and you use the A1, F1 similar to the RCP 8.5. We use the present climate period and three future years, 2020, 2050, and 2080. But uh, in this case, in the William model, we used only for 2020 and 2050. So now these are gra uh, graphics from the IPCC and they are very important because they, they influence our results. So uh, this graph to the left are the temperature change and to the right are the precipitation change. So we have projections for two uh, world temperature change of two degrees and the uh, world temperature change of four degrees. And we can see that for temperature, the highest expected increases are, are in higher latitudes and in, in continental regions. And the precipitation change, it is expected to increase in most of the world in the most extreme scenario, not so much in the two degree scenario. But the most important part of these maps is the, that is expected an, uh, an increase of precipitation, especially in higher latitudes and also in some, um, uh, some desert regions. And at the contrary, 
it is expected that the decrease of precipitation in some sub subtropical regions, and especially in the Mediterranean region. So these changes will affect the soil moisture that will affect, of course, the water availability. So in most of the world, the increase of pre precipitation will not compensate the increase of evapotranspiration. So, and we can see, if you look to the map here, uh, in the most extreme scenarios, we can see that are large regions with the soil moisture, moisture um, is expected to decrease a lot, especially in the Amazon and also in the Mediterranean region. But at the contrary, in India and in some desert regions, um, it is expected the, the opposite, an increase of available water. Uh, for example, here in, the, in the, some desert areas in India and in some higher latitudes, it's also expected a small increase of uh, soil moisture. So this will affect water availability and you will affect our results. So now, uh, it, this is the scheme of the, the William model links uh, that, to, that we used in the, in, in the model. So first of all, we loaded um, in the initial data for precipitation and evapotranspiration. We use the RCP scenarios. Um, again, for the baseline scenario or RCP 4.5, we use linear regressions for computing the precipitation and evapotranspiration because the temperature is an endogenous uh, variable in the model, so it depends, it runs inside the model. But for the other uh, scenarios, we had to change all the model, the emissions, etc. So we simplified and loaded directly the precipitation and evapotranspiration values. So um, the, the precipitation and evapotranspiration changes are uh, if influence the water availability that will influence the will will compute the water stress again uh, with blue water demand so we computed water stress for the 35 and not nine locomotion regions also we have uh, there after that we computed the impact of water availability changes on hydropower and therefore the hydro the hydropower capacity can change in the future, and that is the link. Wait, sorry, that is the link with the energy uh, submodel. So there are three types of hydropower plants. We have the reservoir that that are dams, not, uh, usually large dams that are enabled to storage water for many months, and because of that, we can say that they are mostly influenced by precipitation and also evapotranspiration. So the water can stay there. For a long time, it depends on uh, if the evapotranspiration is is larger or not, and of course of precipitation. Then we have the runoff river type that are usually smaller dams, generates electricity through natural water flow, and again with limited storage cap capability. And then we have pumped storage hydropower plants that store electricity by pumping water up from a lower reservoir to an upper reservoir, usually using wind power or solar energy <clears throat> and then releasing through turbines when power is needed so they are a mostly closed system and they are they have mainly evaporation losses so in our work we we didn't divide in in these three types of hydropower plants because we don't have sufficient data in, in most of the world so we, we have good data for europe and some for and for sorry for other regions but for example in africa it's difficult to find this kind of data uh, so again for these are the total capacity hydropower in gigawatts for the nine locomotion regions for the people uh, who doesn't know the locomotion region so we have here the Euro european union the united kingdom china eastern asia and oceania India, Latin America, Russia, United States, Mexico, and Canada, and the rest of the world. So we can see that total capacity hydropower is higher by far in China, with, with around 400 gigawatts installed. After that, we have in the rest of the world with around 20 to 250. After that, in the United States, Mexico, and Canada, Latin America, <clears throat> 
then, then again also European Union with 150. Uh, Russia and India, and finally in the UK with only five, almost five gigawatts installed. <coughs> Sorry. So here I show uh, in the left is the global net hydropower capacity additions by region from 1991 until 2030. And in the right is by lending countries, but only for 2001 and 2030. But here, here I want to highlight this left graph in the, uh, sorry, right graph, right, right bar in the left graphic, uh, where, where they, they show the projections for this period for 2021 and 2030. And we can see the largest increase will, it's, it's supposed to, is uh, projected to be on China with around, around 100 gigawatts of uh, installed capacity. After that, we have for Asia Pacific, also Europe, Eurasia, North America. And looking for the leading countries, uh, China doesn't appear in this graph because it's too large. So we have 100 here. Then for China, then India, 25, Turkey, Ethiopia, Pakistan, etc. So for the Europe, it's not so, uh, so much uh, hydropower installed for the future because we have already. Uh, a lot of them, but an important thing is that we are installing, we in the, in the world and mostly in, in Europe, uh, we are installing a lot of uh, um, pumped storage hydropower plants. So and th this could be important for the future. Uh, now I will show our results. In this case for the RCP uh, 4.5, again, uh, this is computed with the um, Precipitation in the evapotranspiration ratio, we're using the linear regressions with the temperature of the, the model, the endogenous temperature. So this is the ratio, uh, precipitation and, and evapotranspiration by year. So how, you, how do you compute this? We use the initial ratio of precipitation and evapotranspiration, in this case in 2005, and we divide it by the ratio of precipitation and, and evapotranspiration annually for the future. So uh, if we have values above one, means that this ratio is increasing, meaning that water availability will increase in the future in that region. The opposite values below one means that the precipitation evapotranspiration is increasing, less, um, less water available for the future. And here we can see the only uh, locomotion region where it, it is expected an increase of water available is on India this blue line reaching 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, in the opposite, the lower decreases are expected on the European Union, uh, Latin America, and also the UK. Now for <clears throat> the RCP 6, it's a middle scenario between the RCP 4.5 and the most extreme RCP 8.5. And we can see that is expected again an increase of uh, this ratio or the water availability on India, but not so much, um, not so high as before, around 1.05. Also, it is expected a change on this behavior of the decreasing ratio on China after tw uh, to 2020, and this st starts increasing, but does not does not reach uh, one, and we have. Uh, decreasing and also negative value, uh, negative values of water availability for the future again in the European Union, Latin America, and the United States, Mexico, and Canada. For the most extreme scenario, we have most extreme uh, results also. So for India, we, we have uh, a very uh, large, um, substantial increase of uh, this ratio expected for 2050. Uh, also an increase with the uh, positive values for China and also a very small uh, increase of positive values for the Eastern Asian uh, Oceania. And uh, again, at the opposite, the, the regions where it, it is expected the largest decrease, it will be on Latin America, uh, European Union and uh, the rest of the world. 
here in this table are the results res um, resumed. So these are the a table with the future potential capacity in 2050 comparing with the present, but in percentage looking to the current period. So here are uh, for the RCP 4.5, we can see that the European Union can uh, have the future potential capacity lowering to 7%. 9% on the RCP6 and 16% in the RCP8.5. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, again, we have uh, decreases every, um, almost everywhere except in India and in China in the most extreme scenario. So we we, we use those, um, those uh, uh, projections from the installed capacity until 2030 and and we we computed uh, with the, the water availability but then if we if you model if the the power remains the the capacity remains constant for the future we have an increase and then we have again as a, a little decrease of the potential for the future this is for the uk and for china using the two models the two scenarios, sorry, we have an increased potential, of course, with some limits for the future for the RCP 8.5. And we have, again, a change on the, on this behavior uh, if the, the capacity is for the RCP 4.5, because we have less water available. So th this is a developing work. <laughs> so we went in the next part to study the creation of scenarios linking pumped storage with wind and solar energy uses. For example, for the UK, uh, using a pump hydro power connecting with 25% uh, wind or 75% solar or 50% wind or 50% solar. So, and uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> okay, many thanks so much for your presentation. My question is related with the database, or the information that you use. For, you mentioned something about FEO, right? Yes. Yes. And you have more information, or is the primary resource that you use for that? Uh, for now, yeah, but we are looking maybe to, to make a a, a good article we, we are looking for more more information yes but for now yeah we only use um, this climate data from FAO uh, and the website is there if you want to to check uh, yes yes and in the future world you mentioned also some possibilities to integrate renewables right this is the yes. concept of power to x related similar Yes, but we, because of lack of data, maybe we can use that only for European Union or only for the UK. But yes, we want to uh, run something like that. I, I want to talk with you, Lucas, to, to see that if it's possible. Yes. <clears throat> okay, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Thomas. There's a question. Uh, you, you mentioned these different scenarios, but are these data, these scenarios, this modeling connected with the energy model in, in William? Because uh, there is another, let's say, general scenarios in William uh, uh, related with energy demand and so on and production transformation. So it should be connected with the rest of the yeah, model. Yeah, we, we could check that with Lucas because it's like, it's like I said, it's, it, this is just uh, an ongoing work. But yeah, if we want to make a good article, so we want more, more data, and that's a good option also. Thank you, to to link with the energy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, please. Um. Yeah, I think we we checked this, and, uh, um, and we already implemented it. So there's a switch you can activate this feedback, which is uh, really it, it's one of the important feedbacks of climate change onto the renewable energy generation. It's implemented. I'm not sure if it's activated in the latest uh, version, but I understand we, we have the, this uh, 
precipitation to evapotranspiration ratio endogenous in the model so we can also include this into the hydro into the energy module and this is this can be yeah, the, the link it's what i'm trying to say the link is is done but it's not um, and we also need to check the the capacity values and etc uh, but we can see yes it's a short question yes it's very short thank you very much Thomas, for the presentation have i just a question regarding the the precipitation are you taking into account the frequency the change in the frequency of the precipitation because it could be the case that you have more precipitation in india but the frequency makes that yeah, it's not you are not able to to use this at for either power whatever uh, yeah no it, because yeah it's it's again it's difficult but if you uh, that's a very good question yeah but if you look to the um, to the soil moisture change I, I think they, they have uh, in, uh, taken into consideration in the IPCC this, this effect. So if you look to the soil moisture change, you can see also an increase in India. So it's not so high as maybe as, as we expected, but I think this could be a good answer for that. So it could, it could also increase the, the water in the rivers and etc. Yeah, but it's a very good question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. So, uh, as the title implies, the, the idea of this presentation is to uh, show you the three applications that we developed, uh, uh, the three model, um, sorry, the three modeling applications that we developed in, during the locomotion project uh, to better disseminate our results. And this was a combination, a combinated effort between Cartif, uh, CREAF, and the uh, and the University of, uh, of Valladolid. So first, I will start with a bit of an introduction to actually justify the need for these applications. And uh, I will start explaining how these uh, modeling projects tend to work and what are the problems uh, that uh, we usually find uh, in the end. So these projects or these big modeling projects generally start with a research question. Uh, in this case, uh, for the locomotion project and for other projects like this, it's generally in the in the project call. So you just apply for 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 a specific research topic. Then, in order to uh, answer to this research question, you just develop your big new integrated assessment model, such as William. You combine that with uh, one, two, or more scenarios uh, of different. Uh, of different characteristics and then of course you run some simulations you make your deliverables that you submit to the commission hopefully they'll get accepted and then you do dissemination in conferences workshops and of course you need to publish lots of papers and finally if everything goes well you are able to produce some policy recommendations which is the main objective of of these kind of projects and actually you may be saying well that's totally fine what's wrong with that well the thing is that the development of the model itself takes a lot of resources sometimes 50 60 70 percent of all the project resources and in the end they only get used by uh, their authors and why is that there are several reasons the first one is that these models are complex as you've already seen in this in the previous presentations so there's a steep learning curve then generally the documentation uh, is considered technical depth sometimes so it's not it's usually not very good or it's usually incomplete and sometimes it's also diff difficult to grasp for uh, different audiences and finally these models are not generally or not always accessible sometimes they may be built using proprietary software sometimes they be closed source and 
also most of them have a high computational cost so not everybody can run them in their own computers still you may think well this is not really a big problem well yes because during uh, these projects there's little time to work on scenarios because most of time is used in the development of the model and so policy recommendation uh, policy makers may want to try different policy options and if they cannot use the model they cannot just uh, run these uh, new scenarios and also it's uh, in our understanding it's a wasted opportunity to raise awareness in civil society about the challenges of decarbonization now in order to solve uh, these uh, issues of these modeling projects uh, here i show the 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 openness vision of the locomotion projects so how we uh, approach this issue in locomotion so the idea in locomotion was to actually um, allow anybody with uh, any uh, skill set to be able to run the william model for any purpose also that they can explore uh, the assumptions the hypotheses and equations and also the data and metadata that are included in these models and also that anybody that has the skills uh, required for it they could contribute to uh, improve the model or uh, you know write the documentation or report back and so on and the final goals of all that is just to help policymakers do the job to uh, also let sci give scientists a good tool that they can use to make scientific progress and also to raise awareness and to increase uh, climate and modeling literacy in the in the general public so for that we developed these three modeling apps which uh, have the william model in the background and we are targeting three different audiences so experts and policymakers on one side then the general public or the civil society and also uh, as we will see we have a game we developed a game uh, addressed at high school and graduate students then we also have the Python translation of the William model, which contributes to this openness strategy because it's completely open source. And all the metadata and the data of the project are available in a, in a database and accessible through a, through a website. All these code and all these applications are uh, licensed under the MIT license, so it's completely open source. And of course, uh, most importantly, possibly the three apps are usable in low power computers so anybody uh, uh, can actually run these simulations with the william model in their uh, portable computers or desktop computers and finally i mentioned before that documentation is usually a big problem with these uh, big models so in this case we already worked on that we sorry it's very sensitive so we uh, produce this uh, e-handbook which is we think a uh, good documentation for the for the william model now starting for the for um, from the first of the three apps it's the model analyzer in this case the target audience is experts and policy makers uh, because it's an application that allows uh, a lot of parameterization of the william model um, its architecture is uh, basically a desktop application that you can download you install it on your computer and from these applications you can configure scenarios and then when you launch a simulation uh, it goes to a, a server where the simulation is run and then after the simulation ends you can actually download the results and also <clears throat> plot them using the desktop application and it has high compatibility so it's available for linux mac windows and so on um, in order to well this is the the interface uh, if you click on this button here well you have a simple menu so it's very easy to use you click on this new scenario you give it initial and final time of the simulation then you choose between sorry this was the recording which is i made for this so you will see this thing moving but anyway, hopefully you won't get distracted. So you can choose between two different scenarios. One is more uh, complex, you can parameterize more. And the other one is simpler uh, to make it even more accessible. Then you can define a short name of your simulation or your scenario, a long name and a description. And when you're done, you continue, click on continue. 
here you get a summary of uh, your scenario. You see the William version that is running, the scenario version, uh, the final initial year, a small description that you gave. Uh, and then here you can actually get to configure your scenario. So here you, you have the, these tabs correspond to each of the modules of uh, the William model. So you have demography, energy, climate, and so on. And you click here and a list of the different parameters that you can modify is uh, shown here and you can tweak them. You can modify matrices, uh, uh, drop downs, and so on. You have a lot of parameterization. And in the end, you get a summary of your simulation and you click on simulate. And then, of course, you need to wait a while because the simulation takes some time. It runs on the server, so you don't need to worry. You can go grab a coffee. And then you are able to download the results. And here you can just, well, in this menu, uh, you go to this menu and you can just uh, select the scenario that you, that you run, select the variable that you want to plot with all the dimensions that you want to include. And here you get your nice uh, plots. You can also use this tool to compare two different scenarios to, to see which one fits better your expectations. Now going to the, to the second of the three apps, it's the Model Explorer. In this case, the target audience is uh, the civil society and, and also maybe it's of interest to uh, policymakers. It's, I would say, a simplified version of the Model Analyzer. So it's even easier uh, to access and easier to, to work with. Uh, it's a web application, so you access it from, from the browser. And the results are pre-simulated in most of the cases, so uh, it should be the response of the app should be very fast. And as I was mentioning, the, there's a limited de uh, degrees of freedom, so the parameterization is a bit lower than what you can do with the model analyzer, but still there's the public for this kind of tool. Uh, again, uh, the function is very similar to the previous one. This is the, the website. Uh, you create a scenario. Then by clicking on this button, you are able to tune your parameters. In this case, it's sliders uh, most of the time, which makes the configuration much easier. You have all the modules of William here that you can click and they expand and you are able to access all the parameters for each of the modules. And finally, you can visualize the, the results. Uh, you can also see the list of options uh, that you selected from your uh, parameter configuration. You get to see the, the main KPIs or the main results of the, your simulation. So sea level rise, uh, uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and so on. And you can also finally export the results. Now this is moving fast because it's a recording. Apparently I lost track of my on my time. Uh, so this is um, the third of the of the apps. This is the game. And in this case, the target audience is uh, basically teachers and teachers that will teach to teenagers, of course, and uh, young, uh, well, graduate students maybe as well. And the goal is, of course, to raise awareness of the challenges of making political decisions in the in the current context of uh, climate change and so on. Uh, this is also a web application, so it's accessed through the browser, and the application has two main roles. The role of the moderator, which is the teacher, and then the, the players. The game can be played either uh, remotely from, and in, in this case, the users communicate through a chat, or it can be played in the class, in which case uh, students can argue and discuss um, their decisions uh, in, in real time. So the objective of the game is that the players must choose among a predefined set of policies um, in order to get a good trade-off between global temperature increase and economic uh, growth or, or however you want to call it. Then, uh, of course, the players need to split in, in different teams that compete to one another. Uh, they must agree on the each within each group. They must agree on the decisions they make. 
And after a predefined number of rounds, uh, they get awards according to the results they obtained. And yeah, that was the three main modeling apps of locomotion. And if you want to know more, you can go to the website. You've been referred to the website before. So just go to the website and look on this uh, locomotion models tab. And here you will see all the information. Just to mention that the apps are not yet open to the public. So they will be uh, before the project ends because we still need to work a bit on the, on the scenarios. They are, they are ready, but we still need to uh, work on the scenarios to improve the user experience and so on. So that was it. Thank you for your attention. More people, the more research involved, the less we have in the area. Yeah. So, comments from the side. Time for questions. Yes. Okay, congratulations, Roger, and all the team. That is really useful and really nice to see this dissemination of the project, right? Two comments. The, the first one is related with the scenarios, right? Is, for example, I would like to focus on the or a shipping sector. Is possible to add some particular features to the models? That means if we consider blend this, is possible to add this kind of characteristics in the scenarios? This is the, the first question. And the second one uh, is related. When do you expect to uh, be available for the public, the, the app? Yeah, uh, regarding this, the first question, um, there are two sites. So the model analyzer uh, runs the simulation in real time. So the users actually click on simulate and the, sim the William model runs. So if you want to add new features, of course, you just need to include them in the model and we can uh, make a new deployment with the new version of the model and add the parameters in a very simple way. Uh, actually in the... So all the configuration of the scenarios is done through the through the locomotion data client, which is a uh, I briefly showed it in the presentation, but it's a website in which you see all the metadata of the project, and from there you can actually say by clicking on a checkbox, you can say I want this parameter to be part of the scenario in the model analyzer. So yes, to the first question, yes, and to the second question, when we expect to uh, to have the the applications released, uh, I have the same question. <laughs> um, for us, for the developers of the application, uh, we would have want to have the tools released uh, much earlier. So for us, uh, I mean, we finished working on the applications several months ago, and they're ready. But uh, we are expecting that. Um, the scenarios and the modeling finishes soon so that we can actually uh, make the release. But uh, I'm confident that uh, the modelers will have uh, the William model and the scenarios uh, in the final version before the end of the project, which will certainly happen. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting presentation, not only for dissemination for locomotion, but in general for transparency in science, because there's lots of EMs that not even the modelers have oh themselves, imagine the users. Um, so this, I see this application as uh, very useful for the teenagers or decision makers, different practitioners and policy people. Uh, do you have already research questions that can be answered that provides the boundary conditions of what the model analyzer can do and what it cannot do, which is also one of the limits of the integrated assessment models. They, they, we, all, we normally boast about what can be done, but we don't know very well where are the limits and the assumptions of the scenarios, for example, that we can see if we go really in the details. Will you provide such a guidance for the users in terms of examples of questions that could be answered? That's an excellent question. Um, I think uh, in, uh, of course, uh, Ivan, if you want to answer anything, feel free, because he has also participated in this part. 
Um, I think that the scenarios will be very well described in not all, I mean in the in the deliverables of the project, of course. But then in the application, the users will get uh, a nice description of what each of the parameters uh, represent. Um, and then apart from that, uh, I'm not quite sure that, um, uh, I mean, they, they have full flexibility. In, for, for example, I, I've been uh, working on the model analyzer, which is the one for the experts and so on. Um, and you can have full flexibility. You can use the all the as many parameters as you want for the locomotion uh, for the William model, and you can parameterize them within certain limits because uh, otherwise simulations may crash if you go outside of the range of stability of the model. But you can do, I mean, whatever you want. In the case of the of the uh, model explorer the range of exploration of parameters is smaller just because we want to uh, limit the complexity of the tool so that uh, users can really uh, see what the app can do and uh, and and limit the complexity of of, of the tool and then for the game um, they, they have a limited as well they have a limited number of options of uh, policies and they in the help uh, they get recommendations and, and explanations of what each policy implies. So I think that's, uh, I mean, it's targeted. So I would say that the model analyzer has less guidance because it's for experts and policymakers. The, the model explorer is a bit more uh, simplified and guided. And of course, the game, which is intended for teenagers, is much more, has more, much more uh, explanations and, and so on. Yes. Oh, presented today there is the model itself you have the full access to the code and you can change whatever you want it's not just that you can change the parameters as roger mentioned but you can also include new equations or whatever you want so it's fully access all the code okay, thank you thank you very much thank we are using the number the of the Hi, everybody. So, yes, I, I'm going to present a simulation of alternative sustainability paradigms with the William model. No, you see a bunch of co authors. So, this is the main contributors from the World Package 8 of the Locomotion Project, which is focused on policies and, and scenarios. Okay, so the first thing is that I'm not going exactly to present uh, what is under the title because uh, as you are listening, the William model is still not fully finished and in order to run a simulation scenario with all the model, we need that all the pieces are there and working, no? So what I'm going to present today is uh, the methodology we have developed and then what is the current status. So I would like to start with a bit of the context uh, to have a bit of a broad picture because this is the main motivation to develop uh, integrated assessment models. Um, so we, we are in a context of environmental and social and sustainability. Okay, so I think this is not uh, new for anybody, but I want to stress it. So in, if we take as reference the planetary boundaries framework, uh, we have that already. Uh, six as out of nine planetary boundaries are transgressed. So here you can see climate change that is, is the most popular and overwhelmingly amount of research is dedicated to the problem of climate change. But then you have other problems such as novel entities, biosphere integrity, land system change, freshwater change, biogeochemical flows, which are much less studied. So it's very important that when we try to solve one problem 
of in terms of planetary boundaries we don't create additional problems in other dimensions which you don't see if you don't have a model which has all the dimensions i think i went to the end okay and then the other the other side of the coin is the human needs no because if we are uh, uh, using resources is to cover our needs and then we see we can see that at global level there are many basic human needs that, that, that are not covered for many many people no so this is one assessment published by some authors where you can see that in terms of sanitation sanitation poverty education equality etc we are really below below the, the human basic needs so the challenge is how we can be sustainable and provide cover the basic needs without shooting the planetary boundaries so this is why integrated assessment models are an interesting tool because if sustainability both social and environmental is multidimensional you need a model which is multidimensional in order to analyze it and these models are called integrated assessment models mm -hmm. okay so you have always two two big parts you have the representation of human systems with uh, dimensions such as economy population food transport technology etc of course energy and then you have the interaction between them and with natural earth system so typically climate uh, system ocean system uh, land system etc so the key is the integration of the different subsystems in a coherent set to be able to test where the current trends take us we identify some problems and then we try to see which policies could help us to correct them so if we overlap the planetary boundaries framework environmental side with the uh, social boundaries framework you come up with what it is called the donuts that has become quite popular the donuts economics so the idea is that uh, we are able to develop scenarios which are sustainable from an uh, environmental point of view which respect the ecological limits but which do not undermine the social foundation which provide basic needs to everybody so the objective with integrated assessment models is to find pathways that go here inside the door of the donuts, let's say. Okay, so for those familiar with integrated assessment models, you know that there are many models already. So maybe one question that you can have is why another model, no? Uh, so we have some specificities uh, uh, that I don't have time to explain here. Uh, but I recommend, of course, we have the website, but this afternoon we have a side event dedicated to William model. So if you want a, a more structured, let's say, presentation of the modules, a more methodological, if you're interested in this type of details, this afternoon we are going to have two hours in which we are going to go module by module explaining each one. So I recommend you to attend if you are interested. But basically, the, the strong point of William, from my, my point of view, is that uh, the, the idea is to capture the socioeconomic implications of the energy transition with uh, trying to account for biophysical constraints. And then another novelty, which is belongs to the, my presentation, is that we are trying to have a plural, plurality in terms of uh, analysis of different sustainability strategies. We, uh, we are, I will explain later, but uh, we would like to focus on green growth, green deal, and post growth. So, as you, as you probably all know, in the IPCC framework, everything related to post growth is not present. So, before uh, going into the details of the methodology, I would like to explain a bit the method to run a scenario with an integrated assessment model because it's, they are very complex models. So, there is, this has to be formalized. Uh, so, first, you have the model with the interlinkages between modules, but of course a model does not produce any results, you need a scenario, no? So the starting point uh, with integrated assessment models is storylines. Storylines is uh, a way uh, to say that you need a coherent story of the, how the future might evolve and which is totally independent of your individual uh, preferences, no? So the idea is that uh, the models have many entry points and you need to configure them in a coherent way. The quantification of these entry points is what we call scenarios, and there are main, mainly two, we distinguish two categories. Uh, we have policies. With policies, we mean um, things that are under the human control. 
So, for example, if there is a political will to promote some technology, you can put incentives, whatever. So these are what we call policies. And the other one is hypothesis. And hypothesis, of course, all the model is built out of hypothesis, but we identify some hypotheses that are key for building the scenarios. And these hypotheses are things that are uncertain, but we, that are outside of our control. And I can give you a very easy example. Uh, how much lithium is available below the ground. So this is very important for the outcome of the model, but there is uncertain. Okay, so once you have these uh, elements, policies and hypotheses, you can build different scen uh, scenarios based on different narratives. So in EAMS, typically, we work with two types of scenarios. A baseline scenario, which is a reference scenario, which typically represents current trends, and then we build alternative scenarios to try to correct these trends. So when you define the storyline, you parameterize the scenarios, you run the model, you get some results. So you check against a list of goals that you have. You want to reach some goals with your, uh, with your uh, alternative scenarios. This is typically an itera iterative, uh, iterative procedure, no? because you need to maybe check some things or correct some things or adjust some parameters. No? And then if you, when you are satisfied with your results, you are able to produce policy recommendations. Here, this is, uh, this is a linear scheme, if you see. no. But it is possible, this is what Ilya has presented earlier, that you build some optimization trying to vary the range of inputs to try to reach some goals. So there is how it's possible to uh, automatize uh, the search of a solution, let's say. Okay, so why we needed to develop a specific methodology for William? Because William is a very different, has some differences with relation to the standard IPCC model. So uh, for example, in a William, GDP per capita and population are endogenous which are, uh, as you know, exogenous in most models and in the SSPs, etc. Um, in William, we include more overall goals beyond climate change uh, targets. And on the other hand, the uh, SSPs exclude uh, climate change impacts, and as I already said, they exclude post-growth scenarios. Okay, so which was the workflow we apply in, locomo in the work package state of locomotion? Well, we started with a literature review from all these important elements of the scenario construction that I mentioned. No? So we review the literature from very different sources for storylines, policy measures, then for a matching of scenarios and policies, indicators, regionalization, etc. We have some we have some feedback from stakeholders to refine. And then uh, they, there has been a constant iteration with modelers, no? because at the end, this is a co-creation process. The in work package, we can review the literature and make some recommendations, but then we need to check if it's possible the implementation in the model, no? And, and then we can also give recommendations to give priorities. Priorities. So, what is the current situation for each element? So, in terms of storylines, we have one baseline and three alternatives. Oh, so we have the narratives defined, but it is only parameterized for, let's say, a preliminary parametrization for energy module. In terms of policy measures and targets, we, we did a very uh, large review with over uh, 1,500. And now in the model, they are operational around 60. So of course, if you compare 60 with 1,500, it's very small. But if you compare with the state of the art of models and the variety of policies, and also the fact that behind each policy, there are different uh, sub-policies, if you want, related, this is quite already quite good. In terms of indicator, uh, indicators, we overviewed 20 and we have already implemented 15. So this missing of uh, this gap of five is mainly because uh, the, there were indicators related with dimensions that are not represented in the model. So for us, it's impossible to, to have them. Uh, think about biodiversity. We don't have that dimension in the model. Then in terms of hypothesis, we have 11. Uh, for regionalization scenarios, uh, we have 15. And then we are uh, we have done some matching of policies and scenarios, but we need to to implement in the model. So, 
in terms of uh, relevant storylines that we have identified, well, the baseline, my, our idea was to try to follow SSP2, but with modifications, because SSP2 is a bit already, let's say, outdated, and to be a bit flexible in the interpretation of SSP2, but this will be a bit the spirit. And then we identify in the literature three main, and uh, with stakeholders, three main uh, storylines. So first storyline is we have called it a green growth, which is, let's say, the, the, the dominant uh, narrative in institutions. No, It is dominated by, the, by or characterized by market tools and technological development. Um, you can have an idea of what it means with these keywords, no? Economic growth, absolute decoup decoupling, global economic convergence, fast diffusion of low carbon technologies, sector coupling, efficiency improvements. Then another uh, narrative which uh, became very important uh, during the duration of the project, because this project started in 2019, if I am not wrong, or 20. So the EU released the Green Deal package. No? So it became important to, to see what was the value added of the Green Deal, because our interpretation of the Green Deal in the as uh, the EU has framed it is as a green growth complemented with some social policies. So in terms of keywords, it will be something like <clears throat> all the keywords I mentioned for green growth, but adding social inequality reduction, public investment, welfare state, job warranty, public intervention, etc. And then the third uh, alternative storyline that we have selected is uh, 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 a scenario based on post-growth ideas or degrowth. So here we are totally aware that under the name of post-growth, there is a lot of options, but because we have to try, try to minimize the amount of scenarios in this project, we, we, will, uh, we wanted to, to keep uh, into one. So post-growth is everything related with voluntary downscaling and a deep socioeconomic restructuration. And you have keywords such as relocalization, sharing economy, self-organization, commons, conviviality, voluntary behavioral changes, sufficiency, reducing material soup. Okay. So in terms of regionalization, we have uh, developed uh, 15 cases. So you can imagine that, I mean, uh, the world will never evolve in a homogeneous way. This is totally, uh, makes totally sense, but it's very complex to identify which could be the potential uh, behavior of each region. No? So we have developed, from a conceptual point of view, 15 potential interesting cases, and we will see uh, what we are able to, to simulate. No? But basically, what we are interested in is uh, heterogeneous development. Imagine that the European Union chooses one alternative uh, scenario and the rest of the world chooses another. No? So what can happen? Okay, so in terms of uh, so conclusions, um, so some takeaways from our work. Um, first thing maybe is the baseline. The baseline is the reference scenario, but it shouldn't be underestimated the difficulty to have a very good baseline because it's very difficult to represent current trends. Current trends is not objective, it's subjective also. no. And also during the lifetime of our project, we had COVID and we had Ukraine war. So what are current trends? No, it's uh, complicated. Uh, then also, it was very difficult to apply the standard method, uh, scenario methodology, scenario, sorry, standard scenario methodology with our model, because the IPCC uh, standard scenario methodology is very focused for linear models, which have a very linear structure, and our model has many linkages. So you can have a lot of a priori about what th how things are going to evolve, but because they are endogenous in the model, in reality, you don't know. So this we will know when we are more familiar running the, the full model. Difficult, difficulties regionalization, I already mentioned, and then the tools which were presented by Roger because it's very difficult to run this type of tools. So this is all from my side. Thank you very much. So we have uh, connected strongly to the results of our project. I thank you all for the time. I think 
And I think we got very good insight and uh, understanding, I would say, of what's going on within the promoting project, what are the structure, the bugs, the challenges, open question. So thank you a lot for all the members. Four minutes for questions. So the floor is here. Yeah. I will uh, uh, use this uh, short time frame to ask a fast question. I like uh, your donut uh, show and I like donuts. What do you think, um, uh, what we can do? Should we put the constraints for the donuts, like for under or up, or should we put two uh, goal functions uh, from one side of donut and, and another side of donut? In future, and you are the expert in optimization. I don't know. I, I, I don't know which are the differences. I, uh, as as uh, as one of us said, uh, this is also a good question for me. Okay, so thank you. I'll keep it short. Just a wish for the next session. It's very exciting. To be honest, I think uh, locomotion pro gives a very um, interesting model dynamic. You have three versions of SSP one that I'm very curious to, and that's my interpretation of those three green scenarios. So I'm very curious to talk about this, and also the potential to be able to model tipping points, wild cards, so that all those non-linear events that are very much missing. So I hope in the next session to see more of this and to to see where this is getting compared to the. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Once again. Thank you.